Hi there, and welcome back to this free online learning course, Is God Dead? This continues lesson three, exploring the key philosophers and their ideas that shape the Is God Dead discussion. The thinkers we will discuss in lesson three include Rene Descartes, David Hume, Ludwig Feuerbach, and Karl Marx. Now, all famous philosophers, each is invested in the topic of God and religion and therefore shaped what will become this discourse. But in order to better meet your needs, like I did in the first part of this, I'm presenting Lesson 3 as four distinct videos. This part of the lesson discusses the Scottish philosopher and famous atheist, David Hume. Hume's work gives us the ability to question our assumptions about God and how God is involved or not in what we can know about the world. So jumping right in, I want you to take a look now at this famous surrealist painting from René Magritte, I'll put it right here, called The Treachery of Images. It was painted in 1929 by Magritte, and it demonstrates a philosophical paradox that was of interest to many philosophers throughout the centuries. What is reality? Do we live in reality? Or is what we think of as reality only a copy of some realer reality? The painting offers the realistic image of a pipe, while underneath the pipe in French is written, this is not a pipe. Well, then what is it? The painting forces us to confront that the image is not in fact a pipe. The image is an image. What we loosely regard as a pipe is a representation of a pipe. The image is kind of like the closest thing we can approximate to a pipe without having the pipe on our person, without having a pipe in hand. Now, while it may seem as if Magritte is full of pedantic artistic pretense, and he certainly was, you should look into him if you, have, if you don't know about him already, the painting offers an analogy for understanding how we interact with the world. For this painting of a pipe to exist, there would necessarily need to be an actual pipe that inspired the painting, right? Otherwise, Magritte would have no notion of a pipe in his mind to represent on the page, on the canvas. Now this is the logic of Descartes in his argument about God, who we talked about in section one of this lesson. If there was not a real God, then where would the idea of God have come from in Descartes' mind? Now, two possible responses to this question exist. Knowledge of God, or a pipe, comes from a realer source, or knowledge of God comes from experience in the world. Idealism, going all the way back to Socrates and Plato, suggests that there exists somewhere a what we call a logos, which you can think of as a clearinghouse of all the perfect versions of pipes and tables and people and trees and even gods. What we experience of this world is but a degraded copy of those objects that exist in the logos. Alternatively, it could be that the world that we see and interact with teach us what truth is through our experiences in this world. I know of God or a pipe because I've gone to church or been a smoker. Now, philosophers have debated about these two positions for thousands of years. And the first position is called an a priori truth claim meaning it is true prior to our experience of it. For example, God exists prior to our experience of God. This is a classic theistic position. Now the second kind of truth claim is called an a posteriori truth claim, determined as true only after the fact of experience from experience, derived from experience. Pipes, in this case, do not exist in a land of ideal forms. Rather, a pipe is first made based on the experience of needing something with which to smoke. Experience after experience of smoking a pipe leads to revisions in the design of the first pipe so that the design changes over time. These revisions are an example of a posteriori knowledge. In these terms, 
there are two kinds of knowledge, that which is revealed to us from the logos and that which is learned through experience. This sets up the basic tension between Descartes and the Scottish philosopher David Hume. Now Hume is instrumental in helping us to recognize that Cartesian rationality rests on what's called an induction fallacy. I mentioned this in part one of this lesson. You might remember Sherlock Holmes always talking about deductive reasoning. Now, but have you ever wondered what that really means? Deductive means to draw specific conclusions from general concepts. Induction, on the other hand, means drawing general conclusions based on insufficient evidence. Now Descartes holds his argument to be deductive, but Hume will argue that it is inductive. Specifically, Hume will suggest that the relationship between cause and effect is discoverable not by reason, as Descartes maintains, but only from experience. Now this means that the logic Descartes relies on to argue for the proof of God is flawed. Every effect is a distinct event from its cause in terms of reasoning. Basically, the category of experience is both the way we know there is no direct connection between cause and effect, and it's also the means we use to make the jump from cause and effect. Now, Hume is remembered as both an atheist, but most importantly, an empiricist. Now, empiricism is the position that holds all knowledge comes through and is fundamentally shaped by experience. This position tries to avoid any and all a priori claims to knowledge on the grounds that such knowledge can't be trusted, not fully. And why? Because there's no evidence for that link between cause and effect. This empirical position becomes the foundation of Western science, which formalizes the process of learning from experience in what we call the scientific method. Next, I want to take you through the structure of Hume's argument in Skeptical Doubts and Skeptical Solutions, two chapters from his famous 1748 book, An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Now, worth noting, Hume is also a skeptic, just like Descartes, but they arrive at very different conclusions. In fact, Hume argues that all objects of human reason can be divided into relations of ideas and then matters of fact. Now, relations of ideas include the sciences like mathematics. For example, two plus two is four, any time and always. These relations are intuitively or demonstratively certain, according to Hume. Now, on the other hand, matters of fact are not attained in the same way. There is no a priori evidence of the truth of a matter of fact. The contrary of every matter of fact is still possible, and this is why. The contrary of every matter of fact is still possible, since it is perceived with the same amount of indistinctness. This is what we will come to call contingent knowledge. A matter of fact could have been X or it could have been Y. Here's how Hume explains the trouble with matters of fact. He tells us, he tells us that a contradiction cannot be conceived in the human mind. Now here's an example. That the sun will rise tomorrow is no less intelligible to us than that the sun will not rise tomorrow. He goes on to explain that all reasoning concerning matters of fact seem to be founded on the relation of cause and effect. Specifically, it is constantly supposed that there's a connection between the present fact and what is inferred from it. And we all kind of move through the world operating this way. It's part of what happens in a Cartesian system. For example, if a man finds a watch or another machine on a deserted island, he'd conclude that there had once been a man or woman on that island. 
Hume says all other reasonings of this matter-of-fact nature are founded on this relation of cause and effect. Ah, but here's the issue. Here's the break with Descartes. How do we arrive at the knowledge of the relation between cause and effect? Well, he answers that no object can ever discover the causes which produced it or the effects which arise from it if we rely only on our rational faculties. That is, if we do the Cartesian rationality, if we do that system, that method, there's no way we will ever arrive at the truth of a matter of fact. Why? Because that system is circular. We can't get outside of it. From that, because of that, we can draw no inference concerning real existence and matters of fact without turning to experience. Cause and effect knowledge is not a priori knowledge, is his point. Instead, it comes entirely from experience. And Hume elaborates, noting that his point can be believed easily regarding mm, something like what happens when gunpowder is set on fire or what intricate machinery does. That's Paley's watchmaker kind of idea. These could never be discovered through a priori arguments. But it's not as easy to see that this is also true of events. Events, he says, such as the motion of billiard balls running into each other, is such a deeply ingrained habit of our understanding that it's hard to let go of. And this is what Descartes failed to recognize. His assumption of God's existence and the more fundamental assumption that every effect's cause can be determined a priori is the flaw of Cartesian rationality. And for, for Hume and for others, it will become the fatal flaw of Cartesian rationality. Every effect is a distinct event from its cause, and any suggestions to the contrary invoke a belief or a wish, but they cannot be trusted as true. Now here's the intellectual takeaway from that. Experience is both the way that we know there is no direct connection between cause and effect, but it's also the means we use to make the jump from cause to effect out of a kind of necessity, like I mentioned a few minutes ago. If Descartes tells us that all knowledge is locked inside the mind, then Hume is telling us the opposite, that knowledge is locked in experience. We infer not based on reason, but on the things that have happened to us and that we happen to the world. But here's the thing. When we rely on experience, which is all we can really do, then we can only ever come to a probable, he uses that word, probable, a probable inference that cause will lead to effect. This idea of probability and statistical verification becomes the foundation of Western science, organized around the idea that a science experiment can be set up to test an experience. We then count the probabilities of various outcomes of that experience. And over time, scientific knowledge grows through this system. What we can trust within that system grows and our security of it grows also, but only ever in terms of the increasing probabilities. Hypotheses eventually turn into theories based on probabilities and inferences, but nothing more. Science does not solve the mind-body problem or the problem of human reliance on both a priori and a posteriori forms of knowledge, but it does seek to offer a foundation for your rationality and my rationality to interact with one another. The humans are left with the insufficiency of science to secure the certainty so many of us seek, including Descartes. Science is the closest we can get, but even that is only ever an approximation of truth. Custom, he says, is the repetition of any particular act or operation that produces a propensity to renew the same act or operation without being impelled by any reasoning or process of the understanding. 
it could be that God and other superstitions persist out of this custom. Custom, Hume says, quote, is the great guide of human life. It is that principle alone which renders our experience useful to us and makes us expect for the future a similar train of events with those which have appeared in the past. Basically, we act as though it were the case that effects follow cause, even though we can never be sure that effect will follow cause. In this way, Hume dismantles Descartes' argument, but it might also be said he humanizes Descartes' failure. Belief, on the other hand, comes to be understood as a sentiment or a feeling that we attach to a particular set of ideas or matters of fact and customs, allowing our senses, by way of experiences, to arrive at a semblance of truth. And this truth changes based on all these factors as well as yet other experiences. Humans, Hume concludes, believe necessarily because it is how we overcome and yet reinforce this induction fallacy that seems kind of almost hardwired into our brains. We have to believe in order to make sense of the world, whether that's buying groceries or solving complex algebraic equations. This sort of perspective we've come to understand as natural religion, the idea that belief is the jump we make from cause to effect when we don't have sufficient evidence, what he calls the manner of our conceptions of ideas and in their feeling to the mind. Hume's empiricism would help shape the development of modern science and the scientific method, but it leads, in fact, to more than that. It leads, by the 19th century, to the development of what Cornell West has referred to as the normative gaze and the broader ideas of race and racism that we are left to wrestle with today. For instance, Hume is remembered as the thinker who taught us to never trust inductive arguments. Yet, Hume's limited interactions with Africans and black people did not stop him from drawing general conclusions about them. Hume wrote, I am apt to suspect the Negroes and in general all the other species of men, for there are four or five different kinds, to be naturally inferior to the whites. There never was a civilized nation of any other complexion than white, nor even any individual eminent either in action or speculation. No ingenious manufacturers amongst them, no arts, no science. He continues, in Jamaica, indeed, they talk of one Negro as a man of parts and learning, but tis likely he is admired for very slender accomplishments, more like a parrot who speaks a few words plainly. Hume's racism relied on the notion that Africans were naturally inferior to all others. This reliance on assumed natural attributes is an induction fallacy. Relying on insufficient evidence and drawing general conclusions from that. Now, how could such a thoughtful person extend intellectual rigor in the direction of Descartes and theology and God, but not interrogate the other places in his own life or his own thinking where he might be committing the same sort of intellectual problem? Immanuel Kant, who'd come a bit later than Hume, but who would in a way synthesize Descartes and Hume's perspectives followed Hume on the racism bit. Kant said that the Negroes of Africa have by nature no feeling that rises above the trifling and also tells us, quoting David Hume, he says, Mr. Hume challenges anyone to cite a simple example in which a Negro has shown talents and asserts that among the hundreds of thousands of blacks who are transported elsewhere from their countries, Although many of them have even been set free, still not a single one was ever found who presented anything great in art or science or any other praiseworthy quality, even though among the whites some continually rise aloft from the lowest rabble and through superior gifts earn respect in the world. So fundamental 
is the difference between the two races of man, and it appears to be as great in regard to mental capacities as in color. But wait, I thought Hume's skepticism told us that we can't have proof in anything. But somehow, the logic goes out the window when it comes to how these men understand and characterize black folk. That doesn't add up. We've gone centuries not interrogating this discrepancy either. Now, before concluding this section of Lesson 3, I want to note that I'm not simply pulling the race card here to undermine Hume or Kant. Their arguments about God and whether or not to rely on God in service to understanding the world makes their own positions fair game for scrutinizing. I'm not suggesting some sort of ad hominem attack against them, but I am trying to understand if there is a relationship between what's happening for them with the idea of God on the one hand and the sorts of conclusions that they're drawing about people on the other hand. So even if you are totally over wokeness, I invite you to stick around and engage. As we'll see next with Ludwig Feuerbach, it could be that there is a logical explanation that does connect the seemingly disparate positions regarding God and humans held amongst these thinkers. With that, thank you for being here for this section of lesson three of the free online course, Is God Dead? This section has offered an overview of how the Scottish philosopher David Hume matters to the topic of God's death, and in many respects you might imagine Hume having killed God from being a rational proposition within rationality. Nevertheless, God didn't go anywhere. So next we'll discuss what Ludwig Feuerbach has to say about the idea. Thanks again, and click here for the next section of Lesson 3.